All right. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Sorry I'm late. Um, took a second to find the place I was right next to it and didn't realize it. So, but here I am. Um, so I'm Jason Kreidner. I'm an um, employee of Texas Instruments, and I'm a co-founder of BeagleBoard.org and a board member at the BeagleBoard.org Foundation, um, which is a, a nonprofit. Um, and I want to talk to you today about educational robotics and why um, that's critical for all of us here, um, even if what we do has nothing to do with robotics. And, um, and really important for the future of Linux. Um, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, I'll either repeat the questions or give you the microphone. Um, but I, do, I, I would love for this to be an interactive session where I actually talk about um, you know, uh, some of your experiences and why you feel this is important um, as well, or maybe you don't think. Um, and a lot of this I've tried to write from a perspective of those who, who might be a little bit skeptical um, and hope to address some of the skeptics. Um, in the audience, and um, you know who you are. Um, please um, don't be afraid to be a target. Um, so um, jobs are being automated. Um, the, the, the education really isn't there. Uh, that's the, the, the real problem set up. And um, really, computing is very much a human endeavor. Um, it's a, um, it's, it's, yes, we are, we are controlling the machines, and we'd like to keep it that way, um, that we're controlling the machines and not the machines controlling us. But as we're raising um, future generations of people, uh, they need to understand how these machines uh, work. Um, and they need to understand how the people that create those machines work. And that's what I think is really amazing about Linux itself, right? Because it is the most collaborative software project ever on the face of the earth. Um, and um, that's. Um, that's why it's so important, Chris, that's why it's so important um, for robotics to be part of Linux and for Linux to be part of robotics. Um, so, um, you know, one of, those, one of those questions is like, why do I, why do I care um, about, um, you know, getting jobs for the youth? Um, why is that a problem for me personally? Um, if they want to be ignorant, um, I mean, maybe a strong term, I ho um, but uh, if they if they don't want to do to better, let them flip burgers, right? Um, but that turns out to be a really bad answer, because um, uh, because ultimately, if 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 they're not able to do something productive, feel valuable in society, and contribute more, they're ultimately going to be mooching off of us, right? They're going to hurt our standard of living. Um, they're going to hurt our happiness, and they're going to be a problem for each and every one of us. Um, so it's not okay to just say um, that you know it's if 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 they can go flip burgers um, and you know pay the basic bills that everything's going to be um, be happy because they're not. It's ultimately going to go come back and drain on you. And guess what? Um, that job of flipping burgers, it's going away too. Um, that's not going to be there. Um, the robots have already taken over the manufacturing sector. There's a lot going on in the political environment today where people are talking about how we're going to get those jobs back because they went overseas. Um, and I think m most of you are probably where they didn't. Not that many really went overseas. Um, some did. Um, but a whole lot more of them went into robots. And when, you know, there's a trying to do a lot more in higher income places, doing a lot more manufacturing in higher income places, what's that, what's that going to mean is the economics, the, the economics are going to make even more of those jobs be take, being taken over by robots. Um, because, you know, you don't have to take lunch breaks or smoke breaks. Um, and, and so you're, it's already going on in manufacturing. It's, it's dominated the, the job sector in manufacturing. And now it's going on to service sector jobs. Um, and, and so those jobs are going to be going away too, um, to robots. So sorry, you're not going to be able to flip burgers because I've already got a robot to do that. Um, and that's, that's our, that's our imminent future. Um, that's, that's something that's actively happening. This is an example of a, of a startup in, in San Francisco called Momentum Machines. Um, pull a couple of images here of the burger that they created. 
Uh, I, th I find this really interesting because they're, they're grinding up different meats so that you can have, you can actually choose the amount of, of bison versus hamburger that you want in the meat and it grinds it, it slices the tomatoes, it cuts up the pickles, it shreds the lettuce and... Um, and all of the slight factor takes the oil. <laughs> I thought that was the, that's the grease, that's the flavor, that's the good part. So he said, it's, it's 10, it's 10 this, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, somebody's going to get this right, right? If, 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 if they don't, someone else will, right? And I think that's something that we've all learned in, um, in our open source software world and explorations and technology. Um, if you don't go and solve this problem, somebody else will. So guess what? Somebody, as the, as the economic shift for this, and, and we, we already have, you know, the, those wages for these, the, the, the service jobs going up, um, they get high enough, um, it's gonna be replaced by machines. And it's happening. Um, so where, what are they going to do, right? If they're not, if they're not gonna flip burgers, um, what are they gonna do? And um, there's, there's, there's not a lot of sectors. Um, so this is, this is all, this is US, US job data. Um, on the right, and population uh, growth on the left. So the world's uh, currently growing at about 30%. Um, and there's not that many jobs that are actually growing faster than 30%, right? This is a list of them in the United States. Um, if you're supporting wind turbines, um, that's number one growth job um, in the United States as far as percentage. It's not a huge number of jobs today, but it's growing really fast. Um, guess what, that's pretty technical. <laughs> Right? You're gonna need some, some STEM education to go and do that, um, for one. It's a robot, by the way. Um, it's you know, very much in that, that, that vein. Um, but a lot of this, you'll see a lot of um, service sector jobs around um, um, medicine, um, supporting the population that's growing, um, keeping it healthy and, and, and growing. Um, but there's you know, not a tremendous amount of these, um, these jobs. Um, um, home health, uh, so, so most of these are, are health related um, with just a, um, a handful of exceptions with financial advisors and operations research analysts um, and of course um, some technical jobs. But if you look at it in terms of total numbers, um, this, is, this is the top US jobs um, growth in, in technical numbers. It may be hard to see some of these numbers. There's only two of them over $70,000. <coughs> Um, and there's only three of them, I think, over 30, um, over, um, or four, three or three of them over, four, sorry, four of them over $32,000 a year. Um, so most of these are low, low wage um, job growth. Um, so there's, at, at around 60 plus, there's nurses and um, accountants. Um, that's the only, that's the only, uh, that's the, the first two that go past 60. Um, and then the last two are, um, uh, general and operations managers, so you have to, you have, probably have to have some sort of experience to go into management, you probably have to some, have some sort of illustrated skills. Um, and down here, the highest paid on this list is software development, right? So this, this, these skills that we have, if, if you actually want to get paid halfway decently, the, mark, the, the jobs are gonna come from, from software. Um, there was a nice article in, in Wired recently about um, how software is essentially the next blue collar job, right? I mean, this, this is, if, if you want to get a decent living wage moving forward, you're gonna, you're gonna have to have um, programming skills. Um, and, um, and it's, it's a, a lot of the importance for us, it's like, okay, we, they, that's what they need to do, um, that's great, but again, why does this affect me? Why do I care? Um, yeah, I don't want them to be a burden, but they can go into to, to nursing and, um, and other types of, uh, of health fields. It's not, they don't necessarily have to go into STEM. You might think that. Um, but it's about our jobs, all right? It's about what we do um, because, you know, just, you know, we're scarce today, right? And that's why we, f we feel the, you know, like we're in high demand. But the demand for us is not necessarily all that high um, because there's, there's not necessarily a great understanding of, of what we create. So if we're not actually helping to build the population's understanding of the, te the technology that's underlying their, um, their life experiences, they simply won't value us. Um, so we need to make sure that they're educated so that they know um, that they should care about things like free and open source software. 
all right? If they don't understand the technology, why would they care that somebody else is locking it behind a vault? Um, they're not gonna care. Um, things like privacy and security, right? Lots of people building insecure um, applications. You know, you're getting notifications all the time about your credit card numbers being um, compromised and, and turning over all the time. And that's, if, if, if there's not an, an appreciation for the technology that's underlying to make that happen, nobody's gonna support the investments to actually fix any of that. Um, so like I said, even though we're scarce, that doesn't mean that the demand is really high. And there needs to be some demand creation um, for these skills. And so they have to understand the technology. Um, and you know, why do they even care about their ability to impact uh, technology, right? They see it moving forward all around them, but unless they understand what their real capabilities are um, for being able to address that and, and what's, what, uh, what it requires, um, they're, they're simply not gonna be able to make educated choices um, ab about where to, to spend their time. Um, and your boss simply won't understand your value. Um, so it matters. Um, and I, I kind of summarized a little bit of this in, in my head as the Gandalf effect. Um, so, you know, you know, Gandalf knows things. He knows how to do things that the hobbits don't, right? Lord of the, Ref Lord of the Rings reference for all of you. Just hopefully I didn't lose anybody there. But, um, you know, so he knows and nobody else does it. So it's, it, he can do magic, right? It's amazing things that, that, that Gandalf can do. And sometimes we as embedded Linux developers and engineers, um, we end up looking like Gandalf um, and the hobbits simply don't understand our value. And I think that that's um, a pretty lonely life. I don't think that's the future that we want to paint for ourselves um, is to just, be, um, just to be magicians um, and sorcerers. Um, you know, I think we want people to actually understand and appreciate what it is we do. Um, and I, I think for this, this I think might touch um, a, a little bit of the, 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 the Linux audience in general, but maybe not so much here at the embedded, embedded Linux conference. Um, but a, a lot of people might have this thought. You know, I have um, plenty of challenging algorithms and stuff to do without ever touching hardware. Why do, I, why do I need hardware, right? There's plenty of problems to solve in the cloud um, and other platforms like, like mobile phones, stuff where the, the hardware is kind of just a platform and I'm just, just coding to it. Um, so why do I so much care about engaging with this dirty hardware stuff? It's gonna, I might burn my fingers, I might, you know, I might um, cut myself, I don't know. Um, so maybe that's not so much true here because you guys are, are embedded. Um, but, I, but I want you to ask yourself, um, you know, what's the real impact of, of what I'm creating, right? Do we need another file system? Um, do we need another database? Um, you know, what are the, do we need another RTOS? Duck. Um, you know, the, I, I think about what the real impact is uh, moving forward about the things that, that you're, you're creating. Um, and recognize that today's hardware is very much a limitation um, to technology and what we can do, right? We're, we're you know, tethered to these um, these devices, you know, these computers and the, these phones, and we're limited by, I can only interact with one thing um, at a time. So I have hundreds of applications on here, but I can only interact with one of them because I have to go through this touch screen, right? And then I have stuff blowing up at me. I, I don't know why this buzzer is going off. You know, 90% of the time I have to ignore it because every application has like one way to notify me and it can't figure out what I'm doing. Right? It doesn't know I'm currently giving a presentation right now and I'd be kind of bummed out if my phone rang. Right? Uh, so, um, and, and the hardware is a part of that, right? It's about if you can create the hardware that interacts with you where you want, when you want, right? When you walk in the room, the lights turns on. Well, that requires a sensor, right? You know, it's, it's simple things, um, but, but, but you know, it, it requires hardware. We're not just gonna get it out of our phones and our computers. That's uh, not enough. Um, and I'll, I'll emphasize this, I try to say this just about every time I talk, um, uh, you know, when it comes to, to open source um, and, and, and doing things that way. Um, atoms are valuable. People understand when they buy something and they hold it in their hands, it's tangible. They understand it had a cost uh, to manufacture. 
right? That somebody actually took some, some goods, collected them, modified them, put them in some condition. They don't necessarily understand that when they have electrons, right? They're freely moving, that's the expectation. Um, now we, we care deeply and, and want to put value in those electrons because we, we understand between us the value of something like Linux, right? But we also understand the value of keeping it free um, and keeping those electrons moving freely. Um, so you know, when, when you think of, well, why do I want to get my hands dirty in hardware? Um, just, just think about that a little bit, right? So when you want to try to produce value for people, um, they understand the value of atoms. Um, and, and why, um, you know, the, the, this, this, is, this is a perspective I have, and I, 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 I'm constantly trying to figure out um, what it is that kids think um, today. So for, for me, this, was very, this statement was very much true. A Z80, an EEPROM, and a speaker um, were endless gobs of excitement and entertainment and everything I needed to get excited about programming, right? Um, I mean, you can, you can build synthesizers and voice. Um, just, just look, like the first time I, I got some code that I, could, I cut and paste and made some voice come out of that speaker, oh my God, it was the best thing ever. And, and that's all I needed to be excited. But what kids are going up, you know, when, when I started with computers, you know, I got the ready prompt and I started typing in, um, you know, stuff at the, the command and I wanted to play a game, I had to type it in and understand it, right? It's just, kids are just experiencing a technology in a totally different way, especially when it comes to computers. Um, so their idea of hello world, you know, is halo, right? And that's probably 10 years old, right? I don't know, I mean, you know, we've seen some, some Minecraft stuff get fun, but that, that's not the same, like, like the, the games and things they experience on a computer are just so amazing and would be so hard for them to try to reproduce or to, to really improve upon, right? They're so intimidating. The wall just looks so high to climb over, right? When I, you know, used to subscribe to Radio Electronics, you know, you could get those circuits out of there and you could put those together and, you know, in a, in a week or two, like, you know, it, it was, it, you just felt like so empowered, right? And you feel like you could take over the world. Computers are not, don't look like that to kids. And that's something that we have to accept and understand. Um, now, there's some great tools out there. Um, I love Arduino. I love Blinky LED, right? Because it's, it's that, it's, it can be just eye-opening when somebody says, okay, I've given it this instructions and it does exactly what I said it to do, right? Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the magic of a microcontroller world, right? Because the only code it's running is the code that you put on it. Um, so it's almost back to the old computer days. And so Blinky LED can be very compelling and engaging. Um, but is it really empowering enough, right? Is, is, you know, I think that we have to look at what the next thing is because Blinky LED is now very pervasive. Um, we've had Arduino since 2006. Um, it's 11 years later. Um, you know, what's the next big on-ramp? Um, and how do, we, how do we make that even, even bigger? Um, we have some great success with robots today already. Lots of good proof points um, with first robotics and best robotics. Um, but, um, and and they're, they're, they're kind of proving these, these items out, right? Because robots themselves can be different enough from their everyday experiences to be exciting, right? It, it's not Halo, right? It's, it's something that I don't see these video games every day, right? Robots are something new, right? I maybe see them on TV or see them other places, but I don't have, you know, maybe you have a Roomba, but, um, you know, most, for the most part, you don't have a lot of robots or you don't recognize the robots in your home, like your dishwasher. Um, so they're different enough to be exciting and they're simple enough to be accessible. Patrick. I just want to echo. Oh, I just want to echo that. I have a video of my 14-year-old son two years ago doing a first robotics competition or build and video of him saying, the day I saw that arm move up and I knew that I made the code do that was the proudest day of my life. Yeah. Thanks for that anecdote. That was perfect. Um, 
Yeah, and, and it, it's simple enough that they can actually achieve that. They can achieve it in you know, a, a couple hours or, or less, right? They can, they can wire something up to a board with a, a driver and a battery and actually write the code to make an arm move. Um, and so it's simple enough to be accessible, and it's complex enough to invest a lifetime of exploration, right? The, this, the problem space in robotics um, is extreme and um, nobody's been able to solve all the things that we already know robots can do, right? We know they can do them, um, but it's a small matter of coding, right? Um, you know, we're, we're not all, we don't all have our flying selfie cams yet. Why, why not? Um, Bill. Doesn't sound. Uh, I just wanted to sort of add a little bit to this because you and I typically come at this from a software perspective and robotics encompasses so much more. My daughter uh, was into robotics and uh, competed in the International Science Fair uh, for a number of years. But when she finished uh, and went on to uh, college, she essentially said, I hate programming. She's now a mechanical engineer. Okay, and when she was... We lost uh, one. <laughs> when, when, when she was... Uh, uh, her first job was actually designing the robot arm, but she was much more interested in making the mechanics of it work. And there's a lot of uh, stuff within robotics that's not just mechanics, not just uh, programming. So we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, it's certainly a broad field and it allows them, um, I, and, and I, I try to start this with a pretty broad, or from the speaker, I try to start this with a pretty broad perspective, right, that it's, you know, we, we want them to know about Linux and we want them to know about robotics, and, and that's not just for people that are going into engineering. Uh, that is the general population. It's like reading, writing, and arithmetic, Linux and robotics. And, and I, I, I don't mean that as hyperbole. Um, I think that those are that sort of basic skills. Um, and if you go into medical um, fields, if you go into financial fields, um, these are still areas that impact your life. Um, and that it, I think it's just you know, be, us being the kind of the knowledgeable ones, right, the, the keeper of the keys, that, that we need to share that um, with the rest of society. Um, hope I'm not being too preachy, but... Uh, I'm going to try to get, get going here. Hello. Okay. So one of the issues is having a convenient place to go and buy these drugs. I call them drugs. Um, and the best drug um, purveyor that I've found is Adafruit um, in New York City. Um, Lamore Freed has done a tremendous amount of good trying to create a maker community. You buy things from Ada Fruit, you get instructions, it's all free. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, even your 8, 10, and 12 year olds can go to Ada Fruit and figure out what's going on. Great, great plug. And I, I, and I agree with that. I would throw the, some folks like SparkFun and Pololu um, sort of in that mix, but I, I think Lee Moore's. <laughs> Lee Moore's tutorials are particularly fantastic, um, and, and we need more, um, more support like that. That's an excellent example uh, of somebody um, helping to solve the problem. Um, and, and anyway, so, so robots you know, are, um, we, we have to see that the, the, the kids see technology differently, um, and that robots are a great on-rep to technology, right? That, that um, it, it allows them to have that hook that just sitting in front of the computer alone isn't, right? And that's because that's, there's so many different ways where we could think about it. Um, I keep coming back to robots as the answer. Um, that's the way we get kids um, into programming. And, and that's all cool, right? But you know, we're at a Linux conference, right? Um, are you preaching robots or are you preaching Linux and robots? And I'm I, I confessing I'm preaching, right? So, and, and it's Linux and robots. It's not okay, it's not enough just to have a little Arduino bot, um, I think that we need to try to get Linux into that equation and to get it in, um, to get it in early. Um, 
So here's a great example, one of the easiest on-ramps to, um, to robots, um, Lego Mindstorms. Um, so with their latest version of EV3, um, so when, when they introduced the EV3, uh, they added Linux. Why did they add Linux? Because they realized the value of community. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's why, right? So um, they wanted to increase the collaboration space, the ability for other people to add value um, into um, the robots um, and to affect um, the, 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 the tooling, the, the, the security, the understanding um, that comes um, in, in, in using robots. So they did it, they saw something. I'm hoping that, that we can see um, some of those same things. Um, so getting those eyes on it, right? See, why do you need collaboration, right? You know, I think the shallow bugs, I mean, most of us subscribe to, the, um, to some of the Eric S. Raymond thoughts and uh, you know, the, the bugs are shallow when you have enough eyeballs, right? And you care deeply about bugs when you're talking about security. These robots are gonna, you know, people are gonna be building robots in the hundreds and they're not always gonna be super skilled at every single level and not, you, when you want them to write their own networking stacks, um, you want them to, to write their own, um, you know, the, uh, um, uh, management of, you know, you know in, in so many different places where, where Linux um, takes, takes care of things. Um, probably not, right? We wanna get eyes on it, right? We wanna give them a common code base and we wanna try to help to work together um, to make sure that that, um, that base is, um, has the eyes on it and it's a, a place for people to go from. Um, and tools like Linux allow you to do things like configuration management, right? So if you're, if you're gonna put hundreds of them out there, you know, how do you make sure that all these little controllers that aren't connected, you don't have some secure communication mechanism? How do you make sure that they're version controlled? How do you, um, how do you monitor them? How do you make sure that they're all, um, that they're all right? So, um, and I, there's, there's certainly, a, um, uh, there's, there's two balancing forces going on here. If it's written on a microcontroller, I write it, so I understand it. Um, I know that nothing else is going to happen inside my system because all the code that it's running um, is mine, um, ignoring the fact that you're calling library functions, ignoring the fact that you're calling, you know, you're relying on compilers to generate the code that's going on there, ignoring so many of those things that you may or may not have some good reason to trust. Um, but you balance that um, against um, you know, running something um, um, like Linux where you're able to, 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 to build off of the understanding of, of others. Um, and, and there is a trade-off, um, but you know, I, would, I would say that the, that's very much in the balance uh, in favor of, of Linux, where you have processes and you can watch those processes, you can look at um, all the kernel calls and, and you can explore everything that's going on in the system. You have um, debuggers that you can run in the system. Um, you, there's just so many different tools um, for you to build upon um, and so many different uh, so many opportunities for that that I think it, it really goes well beyond um, the you know, did I make it or you know, did somebody else. And, and, and so many people are building off of Linux, I think it gives you a very well understood um, starting point. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So at the risk of um, kicking off a buzzword bingo here, uh, isn't IoT and smart homes, I, I think of them as robots, I mean they're just not the conventional robots that you seem to be alluding to in this talk here. I mean, we're talking about sensors, we're talking about collecting all this data, we're talking about security, network. I mean, wouldn't I, you? I, I think that we, we walk past the speaker. I, I, I do think we're talking about the, the, the same thing for the most part, but when you're talking about from a, um, a technology building block, right, because you're talking about sensors, you're talking about network connections, right, if it's IoT or smart home, it is all those things, but where I'm starting in this presentation is, is how do you get that hook into the kids? And it's making that object run around, right? So they start with making the object run around and do physically mobile interactions, and they realize, wow, let me just flip that problem over. Instead of having the robot move around, I can turn that into, I can build a 3D printer. I can build a laser cutter. I can build a dishwasher. Um, I can simply create a door lock. Um, I can cr turn the lights on and off. It, it's, it's, it's just a, the, I'm saying that Linux robotics is the entryway into all those skill sets. Um, and putting robots first, mobile robots first. So 
So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to have the interaction. It's actually great for me because this is this has been all one of the, one of the key differences between PCs and cell phones, and what's happening in Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and Beagle boards is it allows computing to go out to the physical world. So physical computing is the hook that we that is of interest to, to kids, not sitting there with a gizmo that can only interact with pixels. It's and making something, sensing something, and and actuating something in the physical world. And and, and I, there's and there is a lot of amazing and important problems to solve, just in the theoretical algorithm space. Um, but, but again, we're, 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 we're talking about here is the, the, the on-ramp, right? Um, uh, so it... Yeah, it, I mean, uh, I've been a robotics mentor now for about eight years in the high school robotics programs. And when you see these kids actually make something happen in the physical world, that's the difference. I mean, the IoT sensors and things of that sort, we have lots of sensors on the robot, but sensors are just providing us data. It's not really something that the kid can look at. I mean, for instance, um, they were really excited. We had a new sensor that detects spinning axles, and they were excited because they, I could actually show them on the cell phone the infrared light that made it work. They couldn't see it until I showed it to them on the cell phone. And then once they understood that there was a physical thing that was making this counter go up, it clicked. So hopefully we've said it enough different ways now. It, it's, yeah. I, we're, we're all echoing each other at this point. But uh, I mean, then Linux is already there. I mean, when we talk about smart homes and IoT, and I mean, Linux is there. I mean, uh, so, so but, it's, but just, Linux it's just about. The, but Linux isn't always the choice to build robots. And it's not right. uh, necessarily the focus, right, especially around educational robots. I think that Lego is out ahead of the curve on this. Um, first, um, so, so the, the National Instruments with their, their Robo Rio um, is also out ahead of the curve. Um, and I think you'll, you know, that, that relationship between um, them and Lego is also very noticeable in that, um, that realm. Um, but if you, if you look at a lot of the tutorials that are out there that a lot of people are getting started to build robots, um, some, of the, some of the ones mentioned earlier, which are fantastic tutorials, they're very much focused around microcontrollers and do not include Linux in the equation. There are some out there. Uh, most of them are very expensive. Um, the, I, th I think that uh, it's, it's, it's still not at the, the, the affordability and accessibility level as microcontroller robotics. Um, I think that's the reason why you see so much of the microcontrollers. There's also that, that theoretical concept of, well, it, it, I, you know, it's not, I didn't write the code and see it happen. Making that direct connection um, between I wrote it and it happened gets a little bit fuzzier when you're writing a C program running on a, an operating system um, as opposed to a C program that's directly bit banging a, a register. Um, but, it's, but it's not that much different than trusting your, your C standard library or um, your compiler tools, right? I think Linux is just one more piece in there that you, you, you need to start with some trust, but then the great thing about it is ultimately you can, you, you can get rid of that trust. You can look at the source and you can understand every last bit of it. Um, but I think it's an important abstraction layer that, that we should have early roboticists using um, so that they can learn all the rest around it. So they learn about Linux command lines. They learn about um, you know, the, the, the open source processes, right? Not just working on code in a bubble, right, which is what you do when you write a microcontroller program that only runs on your robot, right? They're working in this, this bubble. I started out saying that, that you know, computing is very much a human endeavor, and, and that's what I want to try to take these kids out of the idea that it's just them and the robot, and put them in the idea it's them and all the people whose software that's been created, um, you know, and, and that they're building on top of, um, and all that knowledge that they're working with and the robot, right? So it's, it's getting that human interaction and understanding about Git repos and, and, and you, know, um, you know, configuration management and all those things that, yes, they don't need that to turn the motor, 
but it's there and the concept is there for them to learn when they're ready to move forward. I, I, we're, if, if it's super quick, because I, I, I'm trying yeah, to. It, it just, at this point, I have high school freshmen that understand SSH, type BNC, bug tracking, Git repos, how the compiler Yeah, there's, all there's those be, because they're using Linux, there's so many extra things that they understand that they wouldn't understand if they were just programming on their own in a microcontroller, because they're getting exposed to so much more of the software space. And that's, and that's the critical, it doesn't have to get in their way, a lot of times it can get in their way and that's what we want to prevent. Um, and that, that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but you know, it's so important that um, it is there um, when they're ready to move forward, um, but they're not developing in a bubble. So there's, there's a number of different, oh, I don't know, I'm talking into the microphone. Um, there's, 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 there's a number of different projects out there today where there's good points of collaboration for you folks looking at trying to, to make advances um, in the state of open source software um, on Linux and robotics. Um, ROS is one that really stands out. Um, I, um, I sometimes struggle to really, you know, fully grasp the importance of ROS. Um, it's something that, that I don't necessarily feel like I need, but I'm just not doing things at the scale um, that, that, that a lot of ROS developers um, are. Um, the, it's, its most fundamental element, um, from my observation, is its ability to pass to do message passing, um, and that's—it's um, not Dbus, right? It, It's—it's it's, um, you know it could do message passing between robots and synchronize things between different computers. Um, and it includes some concepts of what it's trying to communicate. And I think that's kind of the, one of the important parts of the messaging layer that's in there is because it's, um, it's done you know, with, um, with understanding the data type of the information that it's trying to send, right? So, so it understands, you know, I'm trying to control a motor, I'm trying to just tell the robot to go to point A to point B. Um, so there's some, there's some distinguishing, it's just not arbitrary message passing. Um, there's a number of great um, autopilot softwares and, and, um, and flight planners and all the things that go around um, deploying drones. Um, there's even some, some higher level management and simulation pieces related to some of these projects, especially like a drone code is an umbrella project uh, managed by the Linux Foundation um, and it includes an, a number of projects um, you know, underneath it. Um, but, the, but they, you know, among those autopilots, flight planners, um, but there's, um, there's a lot more going on there. Uh, RG Pilot, um, I find particularly interesting. Um, it was actually kind of led into some of the creation of drone code itself, um, but now I think they've, I think they've, I don't wanna get too political, but I think they've split up again. Um, um, paparazzi is a good one. Um, so both, um, are, so all of these um, are, so drone code, RG Pilot, and paparazzi are all done to run on both microcontrollers and Linux platforms. Uh, and that's a, that's a bit of a mixed bag um, in my mind, um, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's definitely good that you, I mean, so they, you have a common API base and it transitions across uh, having Linux or, or not having Linux. Um, so I think they're, they're all um, interesting projects to get involved in. I mentioned Lego Mindstorms um, earlier. Um, I think it's, it's, it's nice because you, you, for people that don't want to get much into the mechanics, you, know, you can you know, buy you know, mechanical pieces and just start assembling them um, fairly quickly. And the, the education that you build, there's um, some good off ramps from moving, moving forward. Uh, developer of EV3Dev, um, it happens to be here. Um, that's a, a project that um, uh, takes some of the base code that, that was released uh, open source by Lego Mindstorms and makes it all rebuildable so you can actually create the distros uh, for the, the um, the EV3 itself and customize that distro and also target other platforms um, like uh, BeagleBone and Raspberry Pi. Good. Um, there's also um, um, Legos, uh, which I think bring Java development to there. Um, so if, if you're a, a Java guy, um, I think that one makes some interesting. Uh, one of the most interesting sensors in the robotics world is the camera. Um, that's also, for a lot of your IoT stuff, that's super interesting, right? This bridges so many different categories. Uh, but the OpenCV project is a really great one to get involved in in terms of, of robotics and, and, and advancing um, robotics. Um, I think I've got a, I need a time check, uh, seven minutes? Okay. Um, the, the kernel uh, IIO um, interface is probably where a lot of the different uh, things are gonna go. 
Um, there's a lot of room for opportunity um, in the kernel itself and particularly within the IAO subsystem to improve the state of things um, for um, robotics. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that there's like a standard motor drive or like, um, I think it, I think there's a quadrature, uh, the, the newly there's some sort of encoder. I think that we're still, we, we still have some work to put our hardware encoder support for the wheel feedback and some things like that uh, into the kernel. Um, the, the kernel's really behind in, in some of these areas relative to where people are coding. Um, and um, I'll talk more about that. Um, and shameless plug, um, you know, the BeagleBone Blue project in particular, um, we've got a C library that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about here that's called LibRobotics Cape um, that just uh, kind of abstracts the, the, the kernel and the system um, beneath it. Um, and there's some, some pretty glaring problems um, within it um, that, I mean, it, it, it's great from a usability standpoint, but I think from a embedded Linux and what we'd like to be putting out there perspective, I think there's some, some problems that I would like some contributions from folks in this room um, to, to help um, resolve, um, to really put Linux in its proper place um, here. Um, so you can get some documentation off of uh, strassendesign.com. Um, that's the, the guy that designed um, a, a cape for the BeagleBone, um, provided a, a library. He's a, a graduate student at the University of California, San Diego, and he was, he's had hundreds of students um, utilize this API for creating, um, creating robots. Um, so uh, this is pretty reasonably tested with, you know, literally hundreds of robots um, of, very, of many different types and shapes and forms um, and fashions, uh, uh, tracked robots, balancing robots, flying robots, um, you know, from four, from four props to eight props. Um, anyway, lots, lots of different things. It starts with some simple initialized code. Um, the thing I'll, I'll point out here is that this goes and just when it, it initializes some, some pthreads. So it starts some user space uh, threads. Um, and then it maintains a, a, a file within the file system, the process ID. Um, so if I start up another program, um, I, do, yeah, I could do uh, kill robot. Uh, essentially, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's, it's doing in user space. It's managing who's using this, this broad class of peripheral. So there's only one application using them. Um, I'm hoping that sends some alarms to some people, right? That that's all being, that, that hardware management is being measured in, in user space. Um, but um, it is, um, but at least it's managed, right? So you can have one um, robotics cape library user going on a time if they're following the right API uh, and, and calling initializing and calling cleanup at the end. Um, and then there's some additional state management. He defines four states um, in there, including an exiting state. Um, so that other applications can essentially notify the thing to, to clean, to cleanly shut down, um, and also to um, to notify it to pause, um, to do, you know. So if you, you, you essentially your software kills your pause switch, um, and then this is this is one I kind of wanted to to, to highlight. Um, he you know he's creating these um, these these user space threads, um, and then using the registering a C function callbacks in order to get notification of when the buttons are pressed to make it really great for somebody who's designing a robot, um, but is this the, you know, the right way that you wanna do that in the you know, Linux kernel, and is, is, it, is it events underneath, and just, just some things you might wanna just start you know, kind of thinking about, but this makes it really easy for the, for the roboticist to write a program and see um, to, to adjust their states based on getting the um, buttons um, pressed. Um, DC motors, um, similarly, so instead of just you know, saying, okay, call the PWM um, sysfs entries, um, you know, he's doing that here. Um, um, actually, he's doing, um, he's using some, some, some basic configuration to SysFS and then memory maps the peripherals um, in user space to reduce the latency of the updates. Um, and, and more than that, uh, uh, on the, the, the BeagleBomb Blue, um, for things like the, the servos and ESCs, those are electronic speed controls for building quadcopters. Um, they typically use three-phase brushless motors and they use some sort of, so, um, instead of doing the, the three-phase control on the, the BeagleBone, we, we use what, what most people do building quadcopters, which is use these electronic speed controllers outside, and we send um, pulses to essentially say how fast to turn the motors. Um, but instead of using hardware, these are actually written on a microcontroller, the, the implementation is written on a microcontroller on the BeagleBone, so there's a couple of hard real-time microcontrollers just dedicated to the function of generating these pulses. Um, so he's just using shared memory between the two processors to notify the, 
um, to notify the other processor to generate these pulses of this pattern. Um, and it gives them some, some flexibility of the different types of, of patterns to generate, for, depending on what you're type, if you're controlling servo motors, which you're telling a motor, to, like the servo motor is one that can go from a certain degrees to a certain other degrees back and forth. Um, and you control that with a PWM signal. Um, and in ESC, essentially, you're using a PWM to control the speed. Um, and the motors are directly providing um, a drive output. And, and one of the nice things about this, um, this, this uh, library implementation, and for somebody that's building a robots for the first time, is they're all built into example applications. Um, so if I want to um, build a robot, um, I can simply connect up the motors to the pins and call a C function, uh, not, not sorry, not call a C function, run the application from the command line, um, providing command line arguments to test motors. So I don't even have to create a program in order to test my ability to turn um, an individual motor um, at an individual strength or an individual direction, right? I can just do that from the Linux command line. Um, and of course, all the different other possible ways that you can inter integrate that, right? Um, um, same thing for things like the quadrature encoder. So you're able to go and test all the hardware just running these, um, these you know, pre-compiled user space applications. Um, and that includes other things like um, reading from the, the, the sensors on, on the board, right, for the, for the IMU, um, or for the barometer. So those are important sensors for doing things like balancing robots. So I think this helps provide a framework for building a lot of different types uh, of robots um, fairly quickly and easily. Um, there's nothing magic in here that keeps it tied to a, um, you know, a Beagle platform or anything like that. Um, but it also wasn't obvious that there was something else out there that was as easy as a C function call for um, you know turn turn motor right you know set DC motor um, set set motor right you say which number of the motor or do you say um, um, the float and I mean there's you know of course there's Arduino libraries but stuff but they're not I, I don't think that they're as simple as this um, and this is just just standard C that you compile with GCC right no 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 funky wrappers and um, um, it's not in C++. I consider that a bonus. Um, and, and, and this is where I wanted to try to um, close with some action because I think, I think the, 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 the big message I came in with was like, you know, we need to have um, Linux. Uh, we, need, we need to have robotics running on Linux um, and make sure that that education is going across um, the um, entire world, um, but I, I don't want to. That's boiling the ocean. That's you know kind of grandiose, right? So, what is something that you can walk away um, as a, an, an action? And um, uh, yeah, so I said, the, the, okay, get that that gut feeling that these microcontroller guys are just going to go and screw up the kernel. And I mean, they're they're memory mapping things in user space and doing crazy um, uh, stupid things. Um, but you know, ultimately, they're not going to screw up the kernel, right? There's lieutenant's process. There's, they submit patches that don't work. We're going we're gonna, to um, clean that stuff up. Um, but ultimately, they need your help, right? Um, I, I don't think it's the right way to do these things in, in, in user space, right? And I think you guys, I think you might be able to see the value of putting um, the controls, um, the common controls for robotics, into the kernel. Right, and maintaining that. I mentioned all the great things about using Linux, right? Eyeballs, right? Security um, coming from those eyeballs, right? Additional use cases, right? There's just a whole lot more um, ability to, um, you know, to, 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 to share knowledge um, when you're putting it into that shared code base. Um, so IIO needs more sensors. Um, you know, we need to uh, address people's perceptions in terms of if they see, if, okay, these guys, if they think they have to write a Linux driver, not only is it more work because they don't understand how to do it, um, which is not that hard to compile a Linux kernel module, um, but, you know, it's, it, you know it's, there's a perception, well, okay, what's the API? What's the, the build process, right? It's not that hard, but we need to, to make sure these guys know. Um, and it's seen as adding too much latency, right? Um, they're not sure where to draw the boundary, right? So the, the, you, you want to have um, a program that's your robot, um, but what's, the, what's that boundary into, like, do I put the balancing system where I have to have that latency between the sensor and the motor drive into the kernel? And ultimately, I don't, I don't know the answer, 
the smart people in this room do, at least when we work collaboratively on the problem. Um, so, you know, that, that's something I wanna, I wanna work out, right? So how do we close that loop tightly without having to do transitions between kernel space and user space, like ad, ad nauseum? Um, and, um, um, you know, <laughs> I think it's a statement of the affairs when you see uh, this, I, I'm, I'm really hoping this is not overly political, but um, um, what even the Linux Foundation projects are signing up to do things without Linux, right? Um, it's just, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a, it should be a wake-up call for those of us that really want to make Linux um, pervasive. Um, you know, if it's, it's, why is it not a solution for these things? And that should be something that's a bit of a gut check for us. Uh, I'm not, not questioning their decision. You know, it's nothing to do with that. It's just, you know, what do we, what, how do we react to that as a community? Um, so that's my conclusion. I don't know if I saved, any, I don't think I saved any time. Um, well, I'll, we'll have some, some demos. I'll, I'll kind of show some different things running at the showcase. That's, to, anybody know when the showcase is? Tonight, uh, seven? Five to seven. Five, five to seven. So yeah, so, so come find uh, 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 BeagleBoard at the, the, the showcase and we'll, we'll do some, some demos and kind of do some show fun stuff. But um, hopefully this talk was informative and motivating. Um, I appreciate your time and good afternoon. <laughs>